Hi there and welcome to the Control Geek. Through a little search on the net, I figured out that there is not a good video about gain and phase margin computations by hand. Therefore, I decided to make one. I also include a simple MATLAB code in the description for the most presented computations. Gain and phase margins are wildly employed for determining closed loop stability in control systems. Here, I mainly focus on single input, single output systems and will extend the concepts for multi input, multi output system in a different video. Hopefully, for a given control system and with root locus or Nyquist analysis, it is very important to know that we are using the open loop information to determine the stability of the closed loop system. Based on that, for the shown system, we need to have the loop gain. So if we let g of s to be the multiplication of the plant transfer function g sub p of s and the controller transfer function g sub c of s, then all we need is the loop transfer function, which is simply g of s multiplied by the feedback dynamic h of s. Please always keep this point in your mind when dealing with frequency response analysis or root locus techniques. Now as we have the loop gain or loop transfer function, we can compute the stability margins through Bode plots, Nyquist plot, or direct calculations by hand. Let us start with Bode plot. Once you have the loop transfer function, you can draw the Bode plot to some scale. For instance, let us have the following example in Bode plot. The gain margin can be computed from the following formula. Here, the W sub 180 is called the phase cross over frequency, which is defined as the frequency at which the loop transfer function has a phase response of 180 degrees. To translate these concepts, we first need to locate the 180 degrees on the phase plot and draw a horizontal line until the line crosses with the phase response. The crossing point gives the crossover frequency, which in our example is around 4.8 radians per second. Then we need to know the value of the loop gain at this frequency. This is done by drawing a vertical line from the crossing point all the way up to the magnitude response of the loop transfer function. At the new crossing point, we have the value of the loop gain magnitude, which is around minus 11.8 decibel for our example. With the formula of the gain margin GM given above, the gain margin is found. Here, the gain margin is around 11.8 decibel. Before proceeding to phase margin, let me give a couple of notes here. First, if you have more than one crossing, in other words, you have multiple gain margins, then take the smallest value. Second, if you got no crossing points, then the gain margin is infinity. Now, let us deal with phase margin determination. For a given Bode plot, the phase margin is computed from the shown relation. Here, W sub C is called the gain crossover frequency, at which the magnitude of the loop transfer function is equal to 1. The step of finding such margin involves first, drawing a horizontal line on the magnitude response plot from the zero decibel which corresponds to magnitude of 1, to the curve of the response, as shown. The frequency at the crossing point is the gain crossover frequency, which for our example is around 2.23 radians per second. The second step is to draw a vertical line from this crossing point all the way down to the phase response plot. At the crossing point with phase plot, we need to know the phase angle, which for our example is about minus 126.5 degrees. The last step is apply the formula of the phase margin PM given above to compute the phase margin, which is 53.3 degrees for our example. Once again, for multiple phase margins, take the smallest one. The determination of the gain and phase margins is a little bit different with the Nyquist plot. For a given Nyquist plot, we can identify two points. The first point is the crossing with the real axis. The second point, however, involves drawing a unit circle. The point at which the circle crosses the Nyquist plot is our second point. At the first point, we have the phase cross over frequency. In addition, the reciprocal of the crossing point, capital G, 
gives the gain margin. On the other hand, by drawing a line from the origin to the second point, we could measure the phase angle as well. In the same time, the second point gives the phase cross over frequency W sub C, which we will attempt to compute later in the hand calculation mode. In this regard, let us take an example. The plot shows a Nyquist response of a loop transfer function. The first point that can be identified is the intersection with the real axis as it is indicated by the green point. For the second point, we need to draw a unit circle as shown. Then, we take the intersection of this circle with the Nyquist plot. This is shown by the second green point. At the first point, the value of the plot is around 0 0.3. Thus, the gain margin, which is simple the inverse of this point, is about 3.33. The phase margin is about 67.71 degrees. Now, as I have introduced the determination of the stability margins employing Bode and Nyquist plots, it is important to say that this determination requires that both plots to be drawn to a precise scale. This requirement cannot be achieved easily, especially during exams. Therefore, I am introducing my experience here and will show simple steps to draw the Nyquist plot and compute both gain and phase margins by direct hand calculations. For that, let us have the following example. This loop transfer function has one zero in the right-hand side of the S-plane, along with four poles, three of them are stable. The very first step of the solution involves a table as shown. To fill up this table, we need two steps. The first step is finding the magnitude and phase of the given function when the frequency approaches both zero and infinity. Starting with the magnitude, we need to substitute JW for each S in the given function. Then, we need to take the limit as the frequency W approaches zero and infinity, respectively. Note that these values are the absolute values, meaning that we take the absolute of the final result of the limit function. For instance, the value of the limit function is minus 40 over 6 when the frequency is approaching zero, but we need to take the absolute value, as we will take care about the sign in the next step. With this step, you will prevent the confusion about the angle of the function at zero or infinity frequencies. At this point, we can add these value to our table. The next step is finding the phase at zero and infinity frequencies. For this step, I am introducing the following table that will assist us so much. This table gives the phase of a function in term of its zeros and poles when the frequency approaches zero and infinity. The first row is for a zero at the origin, where it has 90 degrees at both frequencies. The second row is for a pole at the origin, where it has minus 90 degrees at both frequencies. At the third row, we have a zero in the left-hand side of the S-plane, where it has zero degree when the frequency is close to zero and 90 degrees when the frequency approaches infinity. On the other hand, the fourth row shows the phase values when we have a zero on the right-hand side of the S-plane. As you can see, this zero has a phase of 180 degrees for low frequencies and 90 degrees for high frequencies. For stable poles, the fifth row shows that they have zero degree phase at low frequencies and minus 90 degrees for high frequencies. Finally, the last row gives the phases for unstable poles where minus 180 degrees phase is expected for frequency approaching zero and minus 90 degrees when the frequency is approaching infinity. With this table being introduced, we can find the phase of our example as following. First, we need to draw a table as shown, in which we dedicate the first column for the zeros and poles of the function. At this point, you need to write down your function in terms of zeros and poles. Second, and from the previous table, we need to fill the remaining columns. The unstable zero will have 180 degrees at low frequencies and 90 degrees at high ones. For the stable poles, we have zero degree at frequency close to zero and minus 90 degrees at high frequencies. Lastly, for the unstable pole, we have minus 180 degrees and minus 90 degrees for low and high frequencies, respectively. 
As a final step here, we need to sum up the last two columns and add the corresponding values to our table on the right-hand side. The second step in our solution is to find the corresponding frequencies at which the Nyquist plot intersects with the real and imaginary axes. To do that, we need to use the non-zero pole formula of the given function. With this function, once again we need to substitute JW for each Laplace variable s. The resulted function is as shown. Now, we need to write both numerator and denominator in complex number form as shown. Also, we need this final function format B in pure complex number form. This can be achieved by multiplying both numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator function. A genital reminder, the multiplication of two complex numbers is given by the shown rule. Thus, the result would be a pure complex number as the denominator is a real number as shown. This is because when a complex number is multiplied by its conjugate, the result is a real number. As a final step, we can write this function as real and imaginary parts, as shown. Considering this last formula, we can now determine the frequency or the frequencies at which the given loop function crosses with real or imaginary axes in the S-plane. Starting with crossing with real axis. Here, we will take the imaginary part of the shown function and equalize it to zero. This is because any point on the real axis in the S-plane has a zero imaginary part. Solving this equation is like solving the following equation, which gives the following roots. The first root is zero, so we ignore it. The second root is negative, which we ignore as well because we do not have frequency in negative. The third and fourth roots are also ignored as they are complex roots. The only root that we need to consider is the last root, which is a real number. You may have more than one real root, which means that you have more than one crossing with real axis. Here, as we have one real root, therefore we have only one point at which the Nyquist intersects with the real axis. Considering this real root, we need to evaluate the magnitude and the phase of the function gh of jw. By substituting this real root in the function, the result would be minus 0 0.5192. Thus, the function has a magnitude of 0 0.5192 at a phase of 180 degrees. This is because if we represent this result on the s-plane using the polar representation, we need to put the number on the real axis in the left-hand side, which will have an angle of 180 degrees as shown. We need to add this result to our main table. Following the same procedure, we can compute the crossing point with the imaginary axis. But here we need to equalize the real part to zero and solve for the corresponding frequency. This is because on the imaginary axis, each point has a zero real part. As we did above, solving this equation is equivalent to solving the following equation. The result is as shown. The only real root is the first root, thus we have only one crossing with the imaginary axis. Once again, multiple real roots means multiple crossing points with imaginary axis. Of course, we need to evaluate the loop gain gh of jw at this frequency as well. The obtained value is minus 3.9858j, which is equivalent to the same value with 270 degrees angle. This is because if we represent this number on the S-plane using polar system, we need to draw the point on the negative part of the imaginary axis. Thus, we have 270 degrees as our angle. Adding this result to our table will complete the table blocks, and this means that we are ready to draw the Nyquist plot. To do that, first draw the S-plane axis as shown. Then we need to project the computed points in our table on these axes starting from low frequencies all the way to infinity. Based on that, the first point would be the value of the function at frequency close to zero. This gives the red point as shown. The second point would be the point at which the plot intersects with the imaginary axis. 
This gives the green point on the negative part of the imaginary axis as shown. The third point is the point where the plot crosses the real axis. This results in the purple point. The last point is where the frequency is very high. This gives the light blue point as shown at the origin. It is important to state that for multiple crossing with real or imaginary axes, the projection of the points must be according to their corresponding frequencies starting from lowest to largest. The next step in drawing the Nyquist plot is connect these points with a line. Starting from the first projected point toward the second point, draw a curve. This curve has infinite possibilities in between the starting and ending points. Do the same with other points as shown. For the last point, the one at the origin, you should stick to the computed angle, which is minus 270 degrees in your connection. According to the point frequencies, the direction of the plot is clockwise. The final step is drawing a mirror for what you have drawn. And, of course, the direction would also be clockwise. As we have plotted the Nyquist, we now can compute the gain margin. For this example, we have a single intersection with the real axis. Thus, simply the reciprocal of this point is our gain margin. For the phase margin, however, even if we drew a unit circle, as the plot is not drawn to a scale, it is hard, if not impossible, to precisely find the intersection point. Therefore, it is better to employ direct calculations for computing the phase margin. As we have seen in the previous slides, the magnitude of the loop function is 1 at the gain over frequency w sub c. We can exploit this relation for solving for the phase margin as we will see. Considering the function gh of jw, we may state the following relation, from which we need to solve for w sub c. As we know, the magnitude of a complex number is given by the relation shown. Applying this relation on both numerator and denominator, and then simplify the resulted equation, we will end up with the following relation. With further simplifications, we are required to solve for the roots of the following equation. This equation has only one real root as shown. For multiple real roots, you have to do the follower steps for each root and then consider the roots that gives the smallest phase margin. For this real root, we need to find the angle of the loop transfer function. Knowing that the angle of a complex function is given by the shown formula, we can apply this relation for both numerator and denominator and keeping in mind that we have to subtract the angle of the numerator from the angle of the denominator. This is a rule of finding the angle of a rational complex function. The resulted phase margin angle is 19.5864 degrees. You can compare the obtained results with the MATLAB code given in the description. The code also contains the computations of some frequencies along roots of some involved equations. With the computation of phase angle, we have arrived to the end of this video. I really hope that the video was helpful for you. As usual, please do not forget to subscribe to the channel, give a thumbs up to the video, and write your opinion about the introduced contains. Thank you and I will see you in another video, hopefully.